Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Glad to be on this side of the dirt. <laughs> yeah, glad to be alive one more day that our God, our awesome God has allowed us to see this day, July 26, 2020. So much has happened over the past week uh, as the coronavirus has spread across the nation. Um, we need to be in prayer constantly for our country, constantly for the health of our people, constantly for our leadership, uh, those in the medical profession, uh, those in the Center for Disease Control that are trying to uh, tell us what to do and, and keep us healthy. And then pray for our, our people that are just um, caustic and abrasive, those who are just disrespectful and rebellious that don't want to wear uh, personal uh, protective equipment, i.e. a face mask and uh, gloves, not washing their hands. Uh, it's almost like they can care less about their own health or anybody else's. We need to continue to pray mightily for them. And on this day, let's do just that as we open up in prayer. God, we come to you now in the mighty and master's name of Jesus, and we say thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, because you are the great king above all gods. We thank you, Lord, because you are in our midst, that you allowed us to see this day. It's not because we're so good, but it's because you're so good. So God, we bless you now, we praise you, we thank you, God, for uh, our sin nature did not allow us to taste hellfire on last night. But, God, we do understand that uh, those of us that are believers in Jesus, those of us that are saved according to your word, we're, it's not, uh, we're not saved because we're perfect, but we're saved because you're a perfect God. So we worship you today. We praise you. We adore you. We blow kisses at you because you're so awesome, so marvelous. So even now, God, we ask that you might... Uh, continue to minister unto all the individuals we just talked about, those that are in the uh, Center for Disease Control, those that are um, doctors and nurses that are on the front line, that are doing all they can every day to make sure that uh, people that are infected with the coronavirus are taken care of while they're in the hospital, those that are at home wrestling with the COVID-19 virus, God, we lift them up also, God, we pray for those that are on ventilators, people that are um, just ignorant about what's going on and that uh, they think that this disease cannot kill them or that it's fake. And God, as we've had uh, over 100,000 people have died in America because of this virus, we pray right now, God, uh, that your spirit might reign, that the Holy Spirit that is welcome here might reign over people's lives, that whether they want to or not, they'll be caused to do what they've been asked to do. We bind that spirit of rebellion that will cause people not to cover up, not to um, wear a face mask. We pray, God, that people will shelter in place and stop uh, congregating in large groups. Even now, as the uh, virus has spread to more uh, and, and taken major numbers, has peaked in major numbers in more than 28 different states. God, we thank you even right now that uh, those of us in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania and Delaware, are, are, um, our numbers have decreased. But we pray, God, that others will take advice from us and take our example and use it to uh, for their health and their well-being. But now, God, I also pray that you might just continue to bless every listener, every individual that is watching us today, every individual that is listening to us on our prayer line. I pray for those that will even hear this message throughout the course of the week, that they will be blessed by what they hear. So we thank you, God. We praise you. We magnify your name because you're worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. It's in Jesus' name, we say hallelujah and amen, amen, amen. On this day, again, we thank God for all of you that are with us. We're asking everyone on the phone line to mute your phones. Um, mute your phone. Either press the mute button on your phone. If you don't have a mute button, press star six. It should mute your line for you. We thank God for you being with us. So glad to hear certain individuals calling in, like Sister Frances Robinson. So glad to hear your voice this morning. Glad to hear our seniors on board, uh, those that are newer members, those who are, uh, excuse me, newer disciples of Southern, those that are older disciples. Glad to have you here on this Lord's Day. Well, uh, last week we came to you from 
Luke chapter 4. We ask you to come uh, to study, read and study Luke chapter 4 because we just started a series last week on the church. And I'm asking you to do likewise today. Turn to Luke chapter 4. While you're turning there, um, I want you to know that last week I talked about what the church ought to possess. And I told you that the church is uh, belongs to Jesus Christ. It does not belong to us. And I told you that the church, um, uh, since it belongs to him, Jesus tells us that he is anointed. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. So the church, uh, the church itself is not a building, but a body of believers with a specific nature and purpose. That the church itself, we refer to our building as a church. Yes, I know that. But truth be told, the church is uh, a body of believers with a specific nature and purpose. And then I also told you uh, last week that uh, the church um, belongs to Christ. Uh, and since it belongs to him, the church, uh, uh, he possesses it. He ought to possess us because we are the church. We are the church. Those of us who believe in Jesus, he possesses us. So he owns us. He has complete power over us. And he manifests himself through us, through our speech and our actions, and that's how he gets the glory out of our lives. So I told you that the church ought to possess power. I told you that the church ought to possess presence, and the church ought to possess passion. And this week, we want to um, go right back to that same block of scripture again, to Luke chapter 4. And I'm asking that you would um, journey with me to Luke chapter 4, beginning our reading at verse 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 from the New Revised Standard Version reads like this. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went out to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. I'm going to stop right there. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. On this Lord's Day, I want to talk to you from the subject, the church has the good news. The church has the good news from Luke, 8, Luke 4, verse 18. The church has the good news. Some of the bad news I've heard over this course, uh, the course of the week, Again, is that the numbers for the coronavirus have uh, increased. Um, there are killings uh, going on within our major cities, of course, and all over America. Young people are, are uh, dying. Older people are dying uh, through violence in our streets. But one of the things that stood out in my mind was how uh, Republican Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas has introduced legislation that aims at, uh, at the teaching of the 1619 Project. This is an initiative by the New York Times that reframes, it really reframes American history around the date of August uh, 1619. The first, that's when the first uh, slave ship arrived in America's shores, in Jamestown, Virginia. The, the statement from the Senator's office announcing that the bill in introduction um, states that the legislation will be titled the Saving American History Act of 2020. It's important that you understand this. He's trying to get this bill across, saying that the Saving American History Act of 2020 would prohibit the use of federal funds to teach the 1619 project by uh, K through 12 schools or school districts. Schools that teach the 1619 project would also be eligible federal professional development grants, or excuse me, would be ineligible. Now, that's important because people that uh, live in cities or in uh, lower economic districts uh, will automatically suffer. You'll have less money uh, coming to your school districts if he allows this bill and if others allow this bill to be passed. Again, remember that Senator Tom Cotton is trying to make sure that the teaching of the 1619 Project does not go forward, and he's trying to cover that with a, a bill called the Saving American History Act. He's really just saying that uh, this aim of this project is to reframe American history um, Excuse me. He's saying that that really, as we reframe, um, if we do this, we're going to reframe American history. And he's saying that the 1619 project will uh, will consider what is meant uh, by the year of our birth, meaning 1619 as our nation's birth year, because that's when slaves first came, or people first came to America and were enslaved. 
and doing so requires the consequence of slavery and the contributions of African Americans or Black Americans at the very center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are as a country. See, it's so many, Senator Cotton, like so many other people, do not want the poor and oppressed to know the good news, to know the gospel, to know the truth. Perhaps Cotton and other oppressors know that uh, Christ Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's, that's a wonderful promise that can be taken seriously, especially when you feel the need for some sort of healing, whether uh, the difficulty is injury, illness, financial hardship, or troubled relationships or anything else. Uh, even if you're, yes, your head is down, you've been beat on so long, you've been oppressed so long, the good news is that the truth will make us free. And the good news is that Jesus came and, and he is the good news and he comes with the good news. One of the things that we need to understand that the good news, uh, the church has the good news. And, and since the church has the good news, we need to make sure that we understand what that means. As I take a look at this text, I, I can't help but look at Isaiah 61 from the Old Testament. Of course, this is where Isaiah prophesies that this will happen. And then Jesus comes and opens up the scroll in the synagogue and he begins to read as he was uh, called on to read, and he stands up amongst these leaders. And in that day and age, you did not uh, uh, do just that, what Jesus did, but he walks in and he reads from the scroll, and he begins to profess unto them uh, uh, that, uh, as I just read for you hearing, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover the sight to the blind, to let their oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And as he did that, what he was doing, he was saying that the church has the good news. Well, I got three things to tell you about this and I'm get on out of the way. The church has the good news because the good news will enlighten the poor and the oppressed. The good news will enlighten the poor and the oppressed. That in that day and age, you have to understand that the, 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 uh, the word uh, that we find, or the words that we find in the Old Testament are uh, Hebraic words, they're written in Hebrew. And they have a similar meaning to New Testament words that were written in Greek. Um, for instance, we find that um, the, when we hear the phrase to bring the good news in the Greek, it means to evangelize, that Jesus is coming to evangelize. Each and every one of us that have the word of God in us, it's our job to bring the good news. It's our job to enlighten the poor, the oppressed. It's our job to evangelize those that are lost, those that are downtrodden. And when um, those who receive the good news are the poor. The Greek word or the Greek term here means those that are uh, uh, slouched down, bent over, considered lowly or just plain poor. But those phrases bent down and slouched over and considered lowly means those that are oppressed. Um, as I take a look at, again, as these words, I come to understand that it is indeed our job to make it our business to preach the gospel, to spread the gospel, to enlighten the poor and the oppressed. One of the problems that we have in our, in our culture, though, is that we don't understand when we are oppressed. Well, when Jesus came in that day and age and spoke to the people he was speaking to, he understood that Jewish Galileans were heavily taxed by the Romans. The, the Roman culture, uh, you have to understand, I, I really wish I had time to get into uh, church history for you on this, but uh, Rome was not just based in Italy. Yes, that was its headquarters, but every uh, land that they occupied, they considered it Roman territory. It had a Roman influence, and Roman influence even was in Galilee. And because of this, the, Rome, the, the, the Roman Empire was built on taxation and slavery. Well, let me help you understand what I'm talking about here, that, that uh, they overtaxed the people that were there. And these Galileans were heavily taxed by the Romans. They had grain tax. They had leaving town tax. They had coming back into town tax. They had temple tax. They had a uh, harvest tax. They had all kinds of taxation placed upon them. Well, uh, in America, we ought to be used to that because taxation in America is meant to keep the poor and the oppressed just that, poor and oppressed. 
when I, I told Southern uh, approximately two years ago, we've got to be mindful, make sure we write our senators and our congressmen. We've got to speak truth to power, how the, the new tax laws that came in under President Donald Trump's administration was going to heavily tax us even the more. And sure enough, the Taxation America was meant to keep the poor and oppressed just that, poor and oppressed. We take a look at even the 120, uh, excuse me, $1,200 we received from the government. Some people are still getting their money from the government. Uh, don't get too excited about that because we're going to have to pay for that next year when we do our income tax for 2020. We have to understand that as we understand how America operates and how the world operates and how the world used to operate, there's nothing new under the sun. And see, when we look at the poor and oppressed, we need to understand that oppressed people don't always even know that they're oppressed. It, I, I marvel, I marvel sometimes, uh, Sister Holland, and how when I talk to people that grew up in the South, and it doesn't matter uh, uh, how old they are, really anywhere between the ages of 50 and over, when I talk to them when, about what was going on back in the day in the South, some of them uh, usually, most of them use the same ver verbiage. They tell me, well, that's just the way it was. And we really didn't notice this and that was going on. It didn't happen so much like that, at least to my knowledge. What happened was they were under a system that they could not see their way out of. And what happens is oftentimes we walk through life with blinders on because we don't always see how and why things are oppressing us the way they are. We don't always see how and why things are happening the way they happen to us. We just know that stuff is happening. And what happens in America is we begin to realize that as, as we are, uh, some people have been down so long that getting up isn't even on their mind. They've been going through what they've been going through for so long, they don't even see how they can get around what they're going through. And you have to understand that a person of the non-dominant group can experience oppression in the form of limitations, disadvantages, or disapproval. They can even suffer abuse from individuals, institutions, or cultural practices. Oppression refers to a combination of prejudice and institutional power that creates a system that regularly and, and severely discriminates against some groups and benefits other groups. Systems of oppression, the term systems of oppression, helps us better identify inequity by calling attention to the historical and organized patterns of mistreatment. In the United States, these systems of, of oppression, like systematic racism, are woven into the very foundation of American culture, society, and laws. Other examples of systems of oppression are sexism, heterosexism, ableism, classism, disableism, ageism, and anti-Semitism. Societies, uh, institutions such as government, education, and culture all contribute or reinforce the oppression of marginalized so, uh, social groups with, uh, while uh, elevating dominant social groups. The poor are always oppressed, but the oppressed are not always poor. See, the church has the good news, and the church has to enlighten uh, the, the poor and oppressed. It's not our job to always take, take, take. The church shouldn't always be in a position of taking, but the church has to be in a position where it's giving. One of the things we give is enlightenment to the poor and the oppressed. It's the church's job. Yes, I'm glad the Southern Church does great things by feeding the hungry and having NA groups meet there and trying to make sure that we're uh, doing different things to engage people in the community. But all that we're doing now is still so much more that we can do. The Church of Jesus Christ has to make sure that we're not set apart from the world. What happens, unfortunately, sometimes the church becomes just like its oppressor. We become just like uh, the world when we act like the world, when we vote on things. And we even, even when we look down our nose at people within our congregations that might not be of the same economic status you are, that might not have the same educational level you have, you need to understand that we need to stop educating people and, 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 and standing on people's heads and help them understand uh, that the church has the good news and we have to be enlightened and therefore once we're enlightened we can enlighten the poor and the oppressed i'm here today to tell you that the church has the good news and since the church has the good news the good news will enlighten the poor and the oppressed but also the good news will cause resistance to the oppressor yeah 
The, the church has the good news, and the good news will cause resistance to the oppressor. Um, resistance, resistance is nothing more than uh, the refusal to accept or comply with something. That's what resistance is. Y'all already know that resistance is the refusal to, ex to accept or comply with something. The attempt to prevent something uh, by action or argument. Now, we've got to understand this. I want you to understand this, that at, in our resistance, uh, resistance to oppression has, to been, has been linked to a moral obligation, an act deemed necessary for the preserving of self and society. I'm going to say that again. The Church of Jesus Christ has to understand that resistance to oppression has been linked to a moral obligation, an act deemed necessary for the preservation of self and society. And also, as we as we resist, we've got to understand that when we stand up, we're standing up to a, a, a government that's even trying to uh, overthrow what the Church of Jesus Christ is here to do. Uh, it's amazing how uh, Americans will use the phrase separation of church and state and don't even know what it means. It really means that America will not be a government or a country that is dominated by a particular religion. Therefore, we get freedom of religion. When you take a look at the countries that we came from to form these yet to be United States, they had a dominant religion. Therefore, America said we're going to have separation of church and state. But yet, our American government is always trying to tell the Church of Jesus Christ what to do. So we've got to make sure that as we resist the devil, he'll flee far from us. But sometimes the demonic force is being used by, or the demonic forces uses our government to oppress us. I want us to understand this, that while people are being oppressed and we stand up and we resist, those that don't understand, usually people that are in the dominant culture, they, they also misinterpret what we're saying and what we do. They call it lawlessness. They call it a belligerence, envy, or, or even laziness because we're not trying to do what they do. We need to also understand that over the last two centuries, resistance movements have risen um, that sp uh, specifically aim to oppose, analyze, and counter various types of oppression, as well as increase public awareness and supports of groups that marginalize and disadvantage uh, by systematic oppression. In the late 20th century, um, resistance movements such as liberation theology and anarch anarch anarchism set the stage for mass critiques of and resistance to forms of social and institutionalized oppression that have been subtly enforced and reinforced over time. Resistance movements in the 21st century have furthered the mission of activists across the world and movements such as liberalism, Black Lives Matter, and uh, feminism. And as we take a look at what's going on today, again, those that don't understand and our oppressor wants us to think we're crazy, so they begin to mess up our themes and our theories and, and what uh, are the platform we use where they tell us that other lives matter along with Black Lives Matter and they try to distort that whole thing. Don't you dare fall prey to this, uh, this nonsense because you need to be able to voice that yes, your life matters. As a black person, your life matters. You need to understand everything that's going on when that's being said. And yet, uh, I want to tell you to go ahead and Google it, read, the, read up on the history of it, but folk are being doped into thinking that their lives don't matter and the Black Lives Matter movement is of the devil. I say, no, it's not. You need to resist. And the good news, uh, or the church has the good news and the good news will resist the oppressor. You've got to tell the devil no. And the devil is so cunning. His demons are so inept at what, uh, are so so uh, precise at what they do. What they do is they look on others and look down their nose and think we're inept because of our color or our sex or our age or anything else, any other kind of ism that they throw at us. Um, even some of you might have read about Florida GOP representative Ted Yoho, who, who had the audacity, according to The Hill, The Hill is a, a newspaper, The Hill, this Hill reporter overheard the initial remarks Yoho made to Democratic representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York outside the House steps on Monday and sparked a conversation about her position on unemployment and crime in New York City. Uh, Yoho said she was disgusting and told her she was out of her mind. That's what the newspaper said. And then uh, 
Ocasio Cortez said he was being rude and that he uh, called her some explicitives as he walked away. We have to understand that those who oppress us will always try to make us think we're out of our mind. They'll always try to make sure that we think we're crazy when we try to stand up from being bent over. I want you to know that I've made up my mind a long time ago that I'm not afraid of anybody. I'm not afraid of anything because I've got the spirit of the living God on the inside of me. And as God gives me strength, as the spirit empowers me, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to speak truth to power. And you know, here's the thing about bending over for folk all the time. When it takes too much energy to stand back up. That's why I'm so glad the civil rights leaders understood that. People like Dorothy Height, Bayard Rustin, Hosea Williams, Gloria Richardson. I dare not forget C. Uh, C. T. Vivian, who was an American minister, uh, who who was a civil rights leader and a, a lieutenant and close friend, a lieutenant to Martin Luther King and his close friend. And he died on July 17th. Remember that date, July 17th. And then you can't forget uh, people that they called the Big Six. That was Whitney Young Jr., uh, A. Philip Randolph, James L. Farmer Jr., Roy Wilkins. Martin Luther King Jr., and also John Lewis. John Robert Lewis, you know him. He was a politician, a civil rights leader. He was also an ordained Baptist preacher, and he served in the United States House of Representatives for uh, Georgia's 5th Congressional District from 1987 till his death on July 17th of this year. So the church has the good news. The church has the good news. The church will enlighten the poor. Excuse me, the good news will enlighten the poor. The good news uh, will cause resistance to the oppressor. And the good news will liberate the poor and the oppressed. The good news will liberate the poor and the oppressed. Liberation is the act of setting someone free from imprisonment, slavery, or oppression. In other words, it means release. Uh, one of the versions I read of the Bible says that Jesus came to give release to the poor, that the poor have always cried out for freedom. I remember uh, seeing so many video clips and seeing pictures of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he was leading marches and protests throughout the South. I can recall seeing this on the news as a youngster. I was just a little boy uh, when Martin Luther King died, but I remember seeing him and I remember how the, the media tried to make him seem like he was a monster. They, even so, even so much so, they talked about how he was out of order and how the protests were out of order. The problem was that even uh, the, the, um, the, the leader of the um, CIA, he tried to make sure that Martin Luther King was written off as a communist. They did everything they could to make Martin Luther King and the movement for social justice by this uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, they tried to make sure it looked like it was something that was non-American. You've got to remember how the Black Panther Party, also that came about uh, in the uh, 60s, uh, and even it died down in the early 70s because again, the CIA made sure that people like Huey ne Newton and H. Rap Brown and those people were deemed as demons and devils. They talked about how they carried guns, but they never talked about how the Black Panther Party fed hungry children in the morning, made sure they did their homework, how they made sure that the black community was all together and that there was safety in our communities from the police who were also oppressors. Well, I want you to know that the poor have always cried for freedom. The oppressed have always said, stay in your place. There's nothing wrong with your status. Even in that day, the Roman soldiers and the Roman government, the Roman culture tried to oppress the Jews, that they didn't care about poor people. They didn't care about uh, people that were um, uh, disabled. They didn't care about older women that were widows who, who, uh, whose husbands had died by the Roman swords. They didn't care about them. They tried to make sure they would rape and pillage them, and it was okay for Roman soldiers and Roman citizens to rape the Jews and kill the Jews. And in other words, they were really getting away with murder. It was important for us to understand that the poor always cried out for freedom. The oppressed never seemed to hear our cry, but I thank God we serve a God that hears our cry. The oppressed have always said, stay in your place. It's nothing wrong with your status. I want you to understand this, that when George Floyd was murdered on May 25th. 
the protest started the very next day in Minneapolis, Minnesota. On, and then within a week's time, there were over 550 protests throughout the United States. Within a 10-day period, there were protests around the world. But yet in the midst of all that, as I'm a member of a, uh, of a uh, internet page for pastors, a, a social media page for pastors, this one pastor, and I'm glad I don't know his name, don't know where he pastors, don't know how old he is, but he posted something that he must have thought was profound. He said, I was called to preach, not protest. I'm going to say it again. This pastor said, I was called to preach, not protest. Well, I want you to know that he received an onslaught of messages from brothers and sisters that began to talk to him about how he had missed his calling, how he must have forgotten what the Bible calls us to do. And I want to tell you today, any church and any preacher that does not seek the equity of its memberships and the equality of people around the world that seeks to love and take care of the disadvantaged, I want you to know I think they've missed the mark. I want you to understand that I believe that the church has the good news and has to be the forefront of protest. The church and the good news have to be at the forefront of protest. I thank God that he used me to lead the protest in Harlem. I want those that are listening to understand I'm not just talking about it, I'm being about it. I thank God that the spirit of the living God has empowered me for such a time as this to come with a message that might seem controversial. It might seem controversial because maybe you've been oppressed for so long, you haven't even understood what it's like to be free. I have freedom of speech as a man of God. So therefore, I want the church to know that we have the good news and the good news and the church has to be at the forefront of protest because the secret of change, as we seek change, we have to understand that the secret to change is to focus all our energy, not on the old, but on building something new. Think about it, how, how so many of us are under self-bondage or self-oppression. How when we continue to do stuff that's insane and how we tear one another down. In the black community, we have this civil war amongst ourselves. And yeah, let me air our dirty laundry for a second. We have this civil war amongst ourselves that started not in the Middle Passage, not in Africa, not in the West Indies, but on the plantations in America where you have the light-skinned versus the dark-skinned blacks. You had those that were the house Negroes versus the outdoor Negroes, how those that were light-skinned and in the house thought they were better or treated better, and how they might have thought they were better versus those of us that were dark complexion on the outside, and how even as we refer to one another is not even encouraging, not uplifting. It's amazing how in my lifetime I've been called colored, I've been called a Negro, I've been called uh, African American, I've been called black. The most degrading that of, of my culture for us to be called was black. I can recall growing up, every time I was teased, the word black was thrown in the middle of whatever the person was saying about me. And they looked just like me. They might have been lighter complexion than me, but they were black just like me. And so that leads to self-bondage and self-oppression. And think about this, how on July 7th of this year, how we began to boy we boycotted just for that one day. And the NASDAQ numbers fell for record lows just for one day. We stay self, uh, we stay self uh, oppressed and under self bondage when we continue to allow ourselves to be miseducated or undereducated. We need to make sure we're going to school and getting our high school diplomas and getting to, uh, certificates of completion of other kind of trades and what have you. Make sure that we're getting college degrees. It's not enough for you just to uh, drop out of high school and think you can make it on your good looks or maybe you think you're going to enter the rap game or you think you can act and dance that great you or your your basketball game is that tight you've got to make sure that you are getting a full education make sure you understand your own history our language about ourselves is even crazy we've been doped by our oppressor and duped by our oppressor to even where we say stuff like uh, we were brought here as slaves or slaves from Africa. No, we were Africans and West Indians that were enslaved in America. We didn't come here as such. We were enslaved here in America. Our undereducation and miseducation about credit cards and debt. We begin to use credit cards and, and debt and, and find ourselves in debt and we uh, find ourselves in over our heads. And we need to have education about banking and finance. That's why our association being led by myself and some other pastors on the Social Justice Commission 
for the United Missionary Baptist Association are trying to get our church to get together to do collective banking at a black owned bank that we can have money circulate within our community in the in the in the um, Jewish community the dollar spins around the community stays in that community for 28 days in the Jewish community stays in the Jewish community 28 days in the uh, Asian and European American uh, community the dollar stays in the community 23 and 21 days respectively 23 and 21 days and then in the African American community the dollar stays within our community for six hours therefore we we mess around start uh, encouraging everybody else and building everybody else which leads to our own oppression that's why we need to stop buying what we can't afford it's no need you having $300 basketball sneakers and you don't even know how to dribble a ball. You need to stop spending money on high-end technology if you don't know how to use it and if it's not going to be used to educate yourself and your family. You need to stop buying handbags and jeans and cars that you can't afford. It makes no sense to have a $1,000 pocketbook and you never have $1,000 to put in that pocketbook. It makes no sense to buy a car that costs more than what you make a year and you still renting instead of owning your own place. We've got to make sure that we are stop buying what we can't afford. Stop oppressing your own self. We can break free through collective purchasing. I, I shared with the association the other day, we can break through collective purchasing. Let me talk to you about that one second as an aside. That collective purchasing, when we come together, even if we're doing something just like purchasing maintenance equipment, uh, uh, paper towels, um, toilet paper, um, bleach, things that all of our churches use. If we come to together and do collective purchasing with uh, a person that looks like us, it means that the money will stay within our community and also we can get a lower price on the products that we purchase. We've got to stop distrusting one another and begin to do some collective purchasing. I want you to know that Senator Tom Cotton wouldn't want us to know about this and he wouldn't want us to know about uh, Evanton, Evantonville, uh, Florida. That's the oldest black incorporated municipality in the United States. It was incorporated in 1887. It is the first town successfully established by African American freed men. The founding of this town stands as an uh, uh, enormous achievement for once enslaved black men and women throughout the United States. Having to live uh, life being considered inferior to the white majority, African Americans finally found autonomy and freedom for themselves in Evansville. And then he wouldn't want you and others oppressors wouldn't want us to know about Black Wall Street. You remember in 1921, Tulsa, Oklahoma's Greenwood District, known as Black Wall Street, was one of the most pro, uh, uh, prosperous African-American communities in the United States. But on May 31st of that year, um, the Tulsa Tribune reported that a black man named Dick Rowland attempted to rape a white woman named Sarah Page. Whites in the area refused to wait for the investigation process to play itself out. What they did, they, they began to riot, and that's, uh, that rioting lasted two days, and, 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 and they uh, destroyed over 35 city blocks as they went into flames, and 300 people died, and over 800 people were injured. Uh, defense of white female virtue was the express motivation for the collective racial violence. I want you to understand that the Church of Jesus Christ, the Church of Jesus Christ has the good news. The good news will enlighten the poor. The good news will cause resistance uh, of the oppressor. The good news will liberate the poor and the oppressed. And we can be liberated. We are liberated because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. We can vote. We're free to vote. That's one of the ways we become free, by making sure you vote. Make sure you fill out the census. One of, one of the penalties for refusing to participate in the politics in America is that you end up being governed by your inferiors. Abe Lincoln said to sin by silence when they should protest mass uh, cowards of men. In other words, if we're not protesting, he said that all we're doing is being cowardly. And he said that in the midst of his presidency. So we have to understand that what we do now will echo in eternity. That it's our job to speak truth to power. It's our job to stand up and tell a dying world that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The church has the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ 
came not just to forgive us for our sins, but he came to level the playing field. He came to enlighten the poor. He came to cause resistance, and he came to liberate. So therefore, in the 21st century, that's still our job. And Jesus, he did it until they called him to hang, bleed, and die on Calvary's cross. He knew when his time was up. He knew he was born to die. He said, no man takes my life, but I lay it down. He gave his life for us that we might have eternal life with him and the Father and the Holy Spirit in heaven. I'm so glad I accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Won't you do likewise? Won't you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I'm here today as the church of Jesus Christ because the church has the good news. God bless you. Today, maybe there's somebody, maybe there's somebody that's listening uh, either live or listening throughout the course of the weeks or months to come. I want you to understand that what Jesus did over 2,000 years ago, uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, he did it um, for us. He died on Calvary's cross. He did it, and the blood of Jesus washed away our sins. You can be saved. You can be a believer just by believing that he died for your sins, but most importantly, he got up from the grave on Sunday. He got up with all power in his hand. He got up, Sister Tammy Lacewell, and because he got up, we can get up. We can take back what the enemy has stolen from us because we have the good news. And if you're listening to me today and you want to make this heartfelt decision, all you've got to do is say this simple prayer along with me. God, I thank you for hearing me and for giving me life, help, and strength. I'm a sinner, but I want to be saved according to your will and your word. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, and I want him to be Lord over my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's just that simple. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen after this. You don't have to worry about how you look and how you feel. You might not feel like you're different, but if you said that from your heart, something is happening in the invisible that will ultimately manifest itself in the visible, that God is going to move you through a period of sanctification. Sanctification is not a denomination being sanctified, but being sanctified is a process that occurs between the time of accepting Christ and to the time of death or rapture, whichever comes first. And that's where God is setting you aside for a special use. He's developing some stuff in you. He's making you better than what you've ever been before. So we thank God for you that made that decision today. I believe in my spirit that somebody has confessed Jesus Christ as Lord today. We give God praise. Hallelujah. Because the church has the good news. Well, we thank God that we're here worshiping today. And a part of our worship is our worship and giving. And we encourage you to use the Tithely app, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y. Use the Tithely app, and you'll find the Southern Baptist Church on there. We're located 12-16 West 108th Street, New York, New York, 10025. We encourage you, if you're not going to use the Tithely app to send your check or money order, some people still put money in the mail. I don't know why, but anyway, send it, send it so we can do uh, kingdom building uh, right here on earth. We're doing kingdom building right here in the earth. We're trying to set captives free. So we need you to help us to be a blessing unto the Lord. Tithing is a debt. It's not a debt that you owe, but it's a seed that you sow. The Lord requires us to give him one-tenth of all of our earnings, of our time, our talent, and yes, our possessions, our money that we get. I don't care if it's through a government check, through retirement, through you going out and work 40, 30, 60, 80 hours a week. The tithe belongs to the Lord. It's not a debt that you owe, but it's a seed you sow. As you do it, you're blessing God and you're blessing yourself. Everything I have is because God gave it to me and I am a tither and I thank God for it. Everything my family has is because I lined up and have been obedient and so have they. So take your offering in your hand right now and those of you that are, have it with you, uh, maybe you have your uh, offering envelope. I don't know how you're going to send it into the church or about the tithe. Let's talk to God real quick. God, we thank you for this time of worshiping and our giving, and we give back unto you what you've given unto us. And we pray even now, God, you might continue to minister unto us that we might have all of our needs met. And your word says, according to your riches and glory through Christ Jesus, you'll do just that. So we thank you in advance for what you're doing on our behalf. And we praise you and we count it done now in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Well, again, we thank God for you being with us today. We thank God for each and every one of you that uh, continue to meet us on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. 
on our prayer line and at 7, 7 a.m. on Thursday morning. We're having an awesome time. The Spirit of the Lord is with us. People are being blessed by the Word of God. They continue to tell us just how God has answered their prayers. You can meet us on our prayer line on Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. and Thursday morning at 7 a.m. The number is 605-562-0400. 605-562-0400. The area code, excuse me, the access code is 613-4249. The access code is 613-4249. Again, we thank God for you being with us today. Maybe I'm a little over time. I couldn't help myself. I thank God for you being with us. If you've enjoyed this message or if you hated this message, do me one favor. Share the good news. Share the word of God by pressing the share button on Facebook right now so you can tell everybody on your list that the church has the good news. God bless you. We want you to just listen to my brother, my fraternity brother, my brother in Christ, uh, Bishop Marvin Sapp, as he's singing none like you. God bless you all. There's none like you. Again, be safe out there. Contain away your face mask.